It was a time of great stability and prosperity, at least for some. In the 8th century BCE, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, no, though lo no longer unified, were also no longer in the midst of civil war. Each nation had a pretty good king, each with a tenure of over 40 years, which in those days was a sign of good leadership. There had been no major threats to the small states from major Near Eastern powers such as Egypt or Assyria, and peace seems to have been accompanied by prosperity, at least for the privileged few and, according to the prophet Amos, at the expense of many. Amos is the earliest prophet whose words are preserved in the form of a book. Though he hailed from the small Judean town of Tekoa, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem, he prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel. You may know Amos from such famous lines as, let justice roll like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. He was an entirely different kind of prophet. As he himself expressed, he was not a professional prophet or priest like Ezekiel and Isaac. He was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. He was there on the ground, in the field, getting his hands dirty. And it was from that vantage point that he developed a God-given calling to speak out against the injustices he witnessed and experienced. You see, with peace and prosperity came the emergence of an early form of agricultural feudalism. In Amos' time, there was a big push among the elites to produce export crops and consolidate lands under a centralized authority. Because of the increased push for production, many of the poorer farmers fell into debt and became slaves to the large landowners. The elite got richer and the poor became slaves. Amos prophesied against this economic system, arguing that the sinfulness of this kind of exploitation was on par with the war crimes committed by neighboring nations. When I think of Amos, I often picture my friend Nate. Nate is an organic farmer who spends most of his year in Oregon growing organic crops and the rest of the year in Washington, D.C., lobbying on behalf of small farmers and lobbying against big businesses like Monsanto and Big Agro. Amos and Nate know too well how greed and profit can drive markets, grind farmers down, and destroy the environment. Amos and Nate are each called by God to hang up their overalls and head to the big city to cry out on behalf of the land and those who farm it. God gave Amos a series of visions, visions that anyone, even a farmer in the field, could understand. The one we read today was the third in the series. The first two visions Amos sees are images of destruction, locusts devouring newly sprouted grass, and fire consuming the earth. But in each case, Amos speaks up as an intercessor on behalf of the people, and God changes God's mind, and God replies that the vision shall not come to pass. The third vision is of God, standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, holding a plumb line in his hand. A plumb line. I've read this passage many, many times and have generally just written off a plumb line as some kind of measuring tool used in the construction of a wall, like maybe a fancy measuring tape or an early version of one of those architect's triangles. But this time, I did a little digging, and here's what I found. This is a plumb line, a very simple thing 
a string with a weight attached to the end of it, used in the construction of walls to make sure that everything is lining up vertically. Incidentally, if you want to learn more about plumb lines, I'm told that you can find out much more in the Old South Encyclopedia in the article about the construction of the tower. But back to the plumb line. And so when God stands with a plumb line in his hand, the image conveys God's evaluation of the nation. God is looking to see if everything is on the up and up, if everything is upright. But he finds, in fact, that things are off kilter. The society that's being built up is crooked, top heavy. It won't bear the weight. And, as God makes clear, it won't stand for long. God establishes a plumb line in the midst of the people, a guiding tool to help us know if we are in line with God's will, if we are living an upright life. We sometimes talk about being reconciled with God, which means more than just strengthening our relationship with God, although that's part of it. In reconciling with God, we're trying to get in line with God's will for our lives, with the plumb line. I kind of like to visualize it like getting your chakras aligned. But basically, it's about getting in line vertically and aligning yourself with God's will for your life. A plumb line is a very simple thing. It doesn't cost anything, and it requires very little. I made this one from things I found around the church. It's a string with a weight, and it can go anywhere. You don't need to use it in the temple. You can use it in the field. You can use it at work. You can use it at school, on the tallest mountains, in the deepest depths. A plumb line uses the force of gravity to work. It only keeps things straight because the weight is pulled down by gravity, a force that we cannot see. Gravity is something that Amos could have never even conceived of. But millennia before Newton and before Amos, God the Creator somehow worked out that we'd need the force of gravity to make this entire creation experiment tick. None of us could have come up with it with our narrow scope. We can't have a full understanding of the laws of nature and of physics from where we stand. But God is big enough to conceive it. That's why we rely on God's guidance, because God's got the whole picture. God sees the full scope. When we rely only on our own understanding to guide our lives, when we can't look beyond our own feet and seek only the best solution in each moment, often we miss the bigger picture. The lives we build start to list. In today's world of instant gratification and disposable happiness, if what we pursue is simply what brings us the most joy, the joy becomes hollow and cannot stand the test of time. If what we seek is popularity or power or success, whatever that means, only for ourselves, that power or success becomes meaningless. But God has set a plumb line amidst the people, a line that connects us to God for all time. It is a plumb line of love, is a plumb line of celebrating the blessedness of all creation.